things are a lot different today than they were in 1970. I mean, just look at Ron Burgundy compared to me, right? But when you're looking at diet, it's even more clear how different things are. How have things changed with our diet from say 1970, 1975, to now, and how does that correlate with our change in like lifespan and health span? Now, let me make something very clear here. Our lifespan has actually increased since 1970 in America. Well, it has in a lot of places, but our health span has not. And what that means is that even though we are living longer, we are ending up with metabolic disease, we're ending up unhealthy, we're ending up with metabolic dysfunction, and we're not exactly functioning. So our health span has gone down even though we're living longer simply because there's better medicine, there's better medical intervention. So I wanna open with a study that was conducted at Pew Research Center. And this was first looking at calories. It's estimated that from 1970 to about now, our calorie intake has changed from about 1,900 calories per day to about 2,400 calories per day. So it's about a 23 to 25% increase in the overall calories that we have consumed. Now, we could chalk that up to availability, all kinds of things. There's all different things that factor in, like you've got socio-demographic stuff, socio-economic stuff, flat out affordability, just accessibility. There's a number of things. But there's one particular study that really illuminated a problem that we have, and we need to address it. It was published in Nutrition Journal. It took a look at over 5,400 different fast food items. What they found is that just from 2012 to 16, okay, this is the only literature we have on this, 2012 to 16, not even 1970, the mean serving size in fast food has gone up 5%, the mean energy density has gone up 6%, and the overall amount of calories or energy per serving in fast food has gone up 14%. Again, that's just from 2012 to 16. Now imagine how much that has changed since 1970. So yes, we're eating more, we're consuming more calories, but we're also having more energy dense food. Now why are we having more energy dense food? I think one of the biggest pieces that we could play in here is the advent of lots of vegetable oils. Now I'm not going to take a stance on seed oils one way or the other in the case of this video. What I am going to say is they are calorically dense. Now there's problems with them that we could definitely point out. But the biggest issue that we face is we're cramming food with industrial oils to try to preserve them or try to enhance their flavor. And as a result, we're just making them more energy dense. So forget all the stuff that people talk about with seed oils, and let's just say, heck, it's more energy dense, and that's a problem. Now let's talk sources for just a second. Okay, it's estimated that back in the 1970s or so, we were getting about 30 to 35% of our calories from grains and oils. Nowadays, that's estimated to be closer to 50%. Okay, so that's a pretty significant increase. Now, the biggest issue that I have with this isn't the fact that we're consuming more grains and oils. It's more so that as a percentage, that means we're consuming a lot less protein. And if we also factor in that the grains and the oils that we're consuming are probably industrialized junk oils and not exactly the highest quality grains, that's just less room for nutrient dense food. Nutrient density matters. And if the majority of our calories are coming from processed, adulterated, deodorized, bleached stuff, we're not exactly getting nutrition, we're just getting calories. Americans on average eat about 29 to 30% more grains as of 2010 than they did in 1970. Now, if these were whole grains, we'd be having a different discussion. Now, I don't care where you stand on the whole carbohydrate discussion with grains and whatnot. The fact of the matter is, is that the reason we're consuming more grains in America is because we have a lot more refined grains, processed flours, bleached stuff, right? There was an interesting paper that we're gonna unpack here in just a second that actually describes that the difference between a refined grain and a whole grain, again, no matter where you stand in that whole discussion, there's a big difference between those two. So our huge increase in grain intake isn't necessarily a problem because we're consuming more carbs. It's more of a problem because we're consuming food that is rich in calories and devoid of nutrients. There was a study that was published in Eat Right, and it was a meta-analysis taking a look at 22 different studies. And what it set out to do was to determine if people were to consume the same amount of grains 
in a whole grain form compared to a refined grain form. And again, I don't care where you stand on this. It's simply refined versus whole. They found that simply swapping out whole grains from those refined grains, a decrease in triglycerides, decrease in LDL, decrease in blood sugar, decrease in HbA1c, and a decrease in CRP, which is your overall kind of inflammatory marker. Just simply swapping that out, but the fact that we're consuming so much more in the way of processed, hyperpalatable stuff, we're not getting those whole grains in. Well, let's talk processed foods for a second. Since the 1970s, and especially in the last like five to 10 years, there's been a huge smearing and demonization of meat, okay, especially in the way of red meat. Now, again, no matter where you stand in that argument, the fact that we are pushing people away from eggs and dairy and meat only funnels them into one place. Because unfortunately, people are not just saying, okay, I'm not gonna eat meat, so I'm going to eat some squash instead. They're saying, I'm not gonna eat meat, so I'm gonna eat a Pop-Tart. That's not exactly where we're going here. That's not what we want. So we're funneling people into processed food by sake of convenience because we've demonized one whole category. And if you think that processed foods aren't a problem, you really need to look at the literature, okay? You have an increase in fats that are easily oxidized. You have an increase in trans fats, which have countless bodies of evidence against them. Okay, trans fats are not good. They're crammed with sugar to increase the palatability. They, they have all kinds of deodorants and deodorizers and bleaching agents, all kinds of stuff that is not exactly good. And don't get me wrong, a small amount of processed food here and there is fine. But when you are talking 50, 60, 70 plus percent of your whole entire day's calories coming from processed food, this is problematic. We're not going to get rid of processed food. It's part of life. It's part of today's society but it is up to us to make the decisions to opt for minimally processed food. Processed food could be tomato sauce that's been you know, processed in a food processor. Cheese could kind of be processed, right? You can make good food from processed food. You can find macaroni and cheese that is minimally processed. The ultra processed food is the real problem. So you don't have to be afraid of it, but you need to understand what it is, right? I also put a link down below for 30% off Thrive Market. Thrive Market is an online membership-based grocery store. But if you're looking for fun, kind of healthier options, especially when it comes down to processed food, like you're saying, hey, I would rather opt for Siete chips that are using cassava instead of regular corn chips. Or hey, I want a macaroni and cheese that doesn't have the preservatives in it. Or maybe I wanna get some like dehydrated vegetable snacks. It's the place for you. And you can sort by different diet type and all this stuff. They've been a sponsor on this channel for years. So full disclaimer, yes, they're a sponsor, but you supporting them supports this channel. So again, that link is in the top line of the description for 30% off your entire grocery order plus a free gift when you use that special link down below. This next one might be the strongest link that we have as far as data is concerned between the diet change and our obesity change since 1970 high fructose corn syrup. We have increased our consumption of high fructose corn syrup from 1970 to 2004 by over 1,000%, an 11-fold increase. And we can only imagine it's gone up since then. So what the heck is up with high fructose corn syrup? Well, it just so happens that our increase in high fructose corn syrup intake also mirrors the increase in obesity. So let's unpack this a little bit more with a study that was published in Journal Nutrition. This study took a look at 559 adolescents, looked at a lot of different markers, and it did an MRI looking at fat deposition as well. And then they were looking mainly at fructose intake. We're not talking just about eating an orange or eating an apple here. We're talking about like, what's their overall intake of fructose? Because if they're consuming a lot of sugar, table sugar, they're also getting fructose in. If they're consuming a bunch of high fructose corn syrup, they're obviously getting fructose in. What they found is that the more fructose they would intake, the higher the level of visceral fat, not subcutaneous fat. So visceral fat is the most inflammatory fat. That is metabolically active fat tissue that causes a cascade of problems. Now, not only this, when they factored in and adjusted for socioeconomic status, they adjusted for energy, they adjusted for sex, they adjusted for all kinds of different confounders and variables, 
they found that an increase in fructose increased blood pressure, it increased fasting blood glucose, it increased their HbA1c, it increased inflammation, it increased insulin resistance, and a number of other things as well. So what is it about fructose? It does not mean that you need to throw away your fruit. It means that this 11-fold increase in high fructose corn syrup probably comes along with the increase in seed oils, the increase in trans fats, the decrease in protein. It's just one more piece of the puzzle that's making people devoid of nutrients and in a state of what is called overnutrition. Too much fuel at one time. Now one of the most interesting pieces and arguably possibly the most important. So there was a study that was put out by the US Department of Agriculture that looked at protein intake from 1970 to 2014. At first glance, it was really cool looking. We're like, great, protein intake actually increased from a 6.7 ounce equivalent per day of protein up to 7.1 ounce equivalent. What that means is we're literally eating more protein. But then when you look at it, it's like, dang it, okay, we missed the mark. Why? Because the protein quality was way in the toilet. Okay, red meat consumption went down 29%. Egg consumption went down markedly. Dairy consumption has gone down markedly. Now, chicken consumption has actually gone up, so that's a plus, as long as we're getting some protein. But what we're seeing is that a lot of the protein was coming in from pretty low quality sources. There was a 136% increase in protein intake from nuts. I don't have a problem with nuts, but what's going on is we're probably having people consuming nut milks and things like that, and they're counting that towards their protein, and they're thinking, okay, I'm off to the races, but you're getting an incomplete protein. And then maybe you have some almond butter because you want protein, but you just had three or 400 calories in that almond butter to get seven or 10 grams of protein. And meanwhile, you could have had a lean piece of steak or lean ground beef or lean ground chicken or something like that and gotten 40 grams of protein for half the calories, right? So in the same breath, we need to be focusing on calories, but we also need to be focusing on protein, right? We could look at all these different pieces that are coming into the equation, but what it really comes down to is our protein quality has gone down the toilet. And if we can just replace the proteins again, maybe it'll kill our cravings for the other things so that we can start voting with our dollars by just eating the good quality protein. So where have we gone since 1970 and how can we change? The bottom line is that we've started to eat for convenience, we have a crisis of abundance, we have overly processed food that is easy, convenient, and now more energy dense. So I wish I could tell you to just eat less and move more, but you and I both know that that's just not the way it works. Okay, foods have hijacked our brains, right? Like we wanna eat more. And it's one thing to want to eat more, but it's another thing to want to eat more when those foods are now being made more calorically dense and we're being told not to eat the things that satiate us. Of course we're going to be putty in everyone else's hands because we're not in control. So the literal best thing that you could probably do to regain control is take control of your protein intake and let the rest fall into place. You don't need to be a freak. You can have the processed food. Heck, you can occasionally have fast food, but if you prioritize that protein, I promise you, everything else will fall into place. It comes down to a protein to calorie ratio, and I will stand behind that. I'll see you tomorrow.